Okay, I got it. You can go ahead. All right, cool. So um, I'm going to be giving this talk called Futures Common Addict um, about some, it's about some uh, UI work that I've been thinking about for the past couple of years. Um, and I originally gave this talk uh, at this, this conference that we had in LA recently uh, called uh, um, May Day Convoluted Weekend um, that we had over the Labor Day weekend. Um, and it's just sort of a, it had a focus on sort of category theory and uh, um, pure scripts in Haskell, so it was a nice fit. But uh, I'm basically just going to reuse it here. Um, but yeah, you know, there's, I have plenty of slides with like lots of optional stuff at the end, so um, feel free to ask questions like as we go. If there's anything that's not clear, um, I can't see the chat though, so please like check it out. Um, and then if we have time at the end, I'll go through all the optional stuff. But if we don't, no worries. Um, so uh, when I usually give this talk, I say, "Hi, I'm Phil, and you know I write Haskell and Pure Scripts at Lumi," um, and uh, you know. I, one of my one of my hobbies in PureScript is uh, that I like to build user interface libraries. So uh, you know we have a lot of we have like almost too much choice of UI libraries, right? In PureScript, um, like beginners struggle sometimes to figure out where they should start um, and which library they should use. Uh, you know I'm pretty guilty of contributing to that problem. So uh, I like I just like building UI libraries. And I think it's I think it's a problem that. It's a really interesting and rich design space, um, and there's so much room for exploration. So, you know, I think it's a good thing to have a lot of options and, and not sort of tie yourself down to one particular architecture. Right? So, things I've worked on uh, at Lumi, we we built a lot of React components. We have a lot of uh, React applications. So, we built this thing called JavaScript React Basic. It's a uh, simplified layer uh, on top of React. As compared to like PureScript React, which tries to sort of provide everything, um, it's a cut down, uh, you know, subset of that functionality, and it uses some type system tricks to sort of make it look like um, you would, you know, you would expect it to look if you were coming from JavaScript. Say, um, Thermite is an old library at this point. That's a layer on top of the other React library, which is PureScript React, um, which had some core routine type stuff and that kind of stuff. Um, I'm gonna put my phone. On. Um, let me know if that's too loud. If it, Makes the audio hard to appear. Is that okay? It really warm here. Okay. Uh, S DOM is, uh, I wrote a blog post about this thing called S DOM, which is static DOM, um, which is the, the idea is, you know, what can we do um, to, uh, if, if we didn't have the virtual DOM, um, can, we, can we still keep a lot of its nice benefits, um, but without, uh, you know, without having to incur the cost of like diffs? Um, a virtual DOM, so so that was that was the SDOM library. That's kind of interesting. Behaviors is actually like a little cut down FRP like library that um, that I built. That's not really for UI so much as it's for things like um, you know uh, interactive physics simulations that kind of stuff. Uh, but people try building UI stuff with it too, and that's kind of cool. Um, Purview is uh, another thing along the same lines as SDOM, um, but it uses this thing called the incremental on the calculus to avoid doing different also S DOM, which uh, takes a sort of simpler approach. And then um, React Explorer is the stuff that I'm going to talk about today. So this is using uh, some ideas from category theory and this common added QI idea um, on top of React to, uh, to build UI libraries. Um, so point is, I, I like building UI libraries, and there's this whole sort of wealth of approaches, uh, ideas um, that I like to think about. Um, and then my other hobby is that I like to dabble in category theory. Nothing particularly advanced, but just basic stuff. Um, and this React Explorer library and the common added UI stuff like really that melds those two things together nicely. Um, so I'm going to talk about how you might build an intuition for common nodes. Um, and then the problem like trying to solve with this is uh, not just sort of how can we build UIs, but how can we specify the way in which we're building UIs? Um, how can, and how can we talk about the specifications themselves in an interesting way? So. We have lots of different libraries that sort of aim to specify some aspects of building UI. So a good example would be something like the Elm architecture, right? So we say in the Elm architecture, um, we have a model, we have actions, the actions act on the model type, and the actions are generated by um, the UI component, and the UI is in turn um, rendered as you know as the output of a function from the model state. Um, 
So that's that's one way to specify what a UI is. You say, what is a UI? Well, it's, it's that collection of data. Okay. Um, but there's other ways to do it. So React has a slightly uh, different way where you basically drop the action type and you uh, just modify the state directly. So that's another specification. Halogen has its own way um, where you find basically a free monad um, of the sets of queries and interactions you can have with your components. Um, and then uh, write an interpreter for that and then glue together those free monad monadic interpreters. Uh, and, you know, I haven't used Halogen in a long time, but that's my impression of Halogen, right? So all these different um, specifications, and uh, they're all slightly different, but they all have something kind of, um, uh, something sort of in common. So that's what I'm interested in. How can we specify UIs, and how can we talk about specification languages um, in interesting ways? Uh, okay, so I want to talk about intuition. Fear, fear, fear. Fear yeah. the sound is not good. Oh, sorry, one sec. Sorry, can you repeat that? So you yeah, the to... microphone. Uh, there, there, there's some comments about the quality of your microphone, perhaps. Oh, is, is uh, it better now? I had a fan. Dropping out a bit. Is it any better now? Is this is it? Um, no. Yeah, it sound, I, I can hear it, but um, huh. maybe you can try talking more to see. Yeah, it's out louder. Uh, let me try talking louder. If it's not better, you can let me know. Um, I think it's I think it's better now. Okay, I have um, my phone any, on any as well, so it might be that might be why. Well. Um, okay, so I want to talk about an intuition for core monads, right? So before I do that, I'm going to talk about intuition for monads. Um, so everybody's got their own sort of intuition for monads, and um, it's something that you sort of like pick up early in like Haskell and PureScript development, right? It's like you think a certain way about monads, but I feel like fewer people have a good intuition for core monads, and it took me a really long time to get one, and this UI stuff was sort of my way into understanding core monads uh, properly. So, um, you know, people have all these sorts of metaphors for monads, like monads like spacesuits, uh, monads like burritos. People have, like, there's this awesome paper which teaches you all about burritos if you know about monads. Um, and then, you know, so people will say you need, like, good intuition, like a good metaphor, right? And then other people say, well, that's not very good. What you really need is to study the classes and the laws because that's all really a monad is, right? Um, <laughs> so this is another approach. So we can say a monad is uh, any type constructor, M, which is a functor, um, which has these operations, right? So actually, you only need two of these. You need uh, return and join or return and bind. Uh, return embeds A into MA. Uh, so it has no effects if you want to think about this in terms of effects and join collapses two layers of effects and gives you back those effects combined into a single layer of effects with the same return type. Okay, um, and then bind is this function that you can combine that you can define in terms of the two of them where you have an effectful thing an A it returns an A and then you take a pure A and turn it into an effectful B and it smushes those two things together with join and gives you an effectful B back. Okay. Um, so you can write down laws for these things that will give you a bit of an intuition. Um, I like seeing the laws in terms of denotation because it sort of really cements the idea that um, the intuition that uh, you're talking about these sort of sequential steps and your sort of, um, the, the associativity law says that it doesn't matter how you nest do notation, right? It's, it's sort of like well defined to collapse all your nested do notation into one do notation block. Right, so, that, so that's one of the laws, and it tells you that pure is like the identity for, for the unit for both of the sides of bind, right? Um, but another interesting way to look at the laws is to consider the Claisley composition, which is this operation, which takes an A to MB, a B to MC, and gives you an A to MC. Okay, so it, it applies the first one and then binds the second one. Um, and in this form, the laws look like this, which is kind of nice and compact. So it says that F return is the unit of Claisley composition on the right and on the left and Claisley composition is associative. So those are the monad laws <coughs> in uh, Claisley arrow form, right? Um, which is nice. So that's, that's one way you can understand monads, right? You could have a, an intuition or a metaphor, or you could look at the laws, and here's a nice way to think about the laws. They're, they're like functions that compose with a unit called return that is associative. Um, and then if you think about things like arrow apply, you can think about how you lift in pure functions and, and all these things, and, and it gives you a nice intuition as a monad as sort of generalized functions. Um, so you might look at the laws and find some intuition along those lines, but it, it's sort of a partial uh, understanding of monad, just like the spacesuit thing is, right? Um, so we can do the same thing with core monads. Oh, I should say, like, the, the missing piece, as far as I'm concerned, is that you, you also want lots of examples, right? Um, so between metaphors and you know um, 
laws and classes and examples, hopefully you piece together like a whole uh, a whole uh, understanding of what a monad is, right? Over time, and it takes time. Um, we can do the same thing for co-monads. So if we start with the classes and laws, am I am I audible, by the way? Is this any better? Uh, yeah, I think it's better. Um, I okay. haven't heard any okay. other comments, so. Okay, cool. Um, so we do the same thing with co-monads, and we just, you know, turn all the arrows around. Um, Return becomes extract, so instead of A to NA, we get WA to A. Duplicate becomes, instead of you know two Ms on the left, we have uh, two Ws on the right, so W uh, to W squared. And then instead of bind, we have uh, this extend operation, which is uh, this operator here. Um, so we have a WA, and then given a function which takes a whole substructure of WAs and turns it into a B, it'll go over all the substructures and produce um, a WB, where like every every A was replaced with a B using the WA that surrounded it. Okay, so what surrounds means depends on the monad, but that's sort of like a hand wavy intuition for what that function is doing. And just like we had um, Claisley composition, now we have co Claisley composition. So for a monad, we can actually for an extend uh, in the pure scripts. Uh, standard library, uh, you can define this thing, uh, which takes W, A to B. So before where we had uh, A to M, B with the M on the right, and we're interested in these Claisley arrows with M on the right, with co monads we care of a co Claisley arrows where the W is on the left. So given a function which inspects the W, A and produces a B, and a function which inspects a W, B and gives a C, you can pull them together, a function which inspects a W, A um, and gives you a C. So, um, People talk about common as about being like uh, context or values in context or neighborhoods or these sorts of things. So you can think in those terms. You can think about this as being like an A in context gives a B, a B in context gives a C, and the context sort of gets plumbed through where context depends on uh, what you mean by uh, you know what particular common that you're interested in. So um, and you know co Claisley uh, cat is a category, right? And that's the monad, but the common laws tell us that. So we have the same approach to building an intuition. But, you know, for whatever reason, I never found this particularly intuitive, this whole neighborhood or context idea never made a whole lot of sense to me. Um, so this never really helped. And I found uh, myself wanting a better intuition. So you can look for examples, right? We, the, the other aspect of this is um, if we don't have an intuition and the laws don't help much. Um, maybe we can find some examples and study them, right? So here's, here's one commonad called the store commonad. Uh, that you might have seen in the standard library. So a store of S at A consists of a value of type S, which we can think of as like the current state of a system, and a function that given any state turns it into a return type of uh, type A. Okay, So this is like the output type, and this is like the internal state of some machine that we're simulating. Okay, um, So uh, this has a common node instance. To extract, we just apply the function that views the current state at the current um, at the current state, and to duplicate, so we need a store of s, a store of s of a from a store of s of a. So we re return the store um, whose current state is the same state. But then when we pull out, when we render the current state, when we render any given state there, we return a whole store um, centered around this new state there, but with the same rendering function. Um, so again, might not be 100% clear what's going on there. Um, let's look at some more. So traced is another one. So just like we have a writer uh, in, in monads, uh, the writer uh, monad, we have the traced co monad. So W here is a monoid, and if W is a monoid, then we have a co monad called trace W. Uh, it consists of functions from that monoid into the return type. To extract is to just apply that function to the empty monoidal value, and to duplicate well, we end up with two layers of trace, so we end up with two Ws essentially, and we just monoidally append them together. Okay. Um, again, maybe not so clear what's going on just from the example, so to dig a little bit more. Um, so let's try and build an intuition for these things. Um, I can't give you, I can sort of show you my intuition by talking about UIs, but uh, it took a while for me to get there. So here's some papers that I read and some libraries and blog posts and stuff that helps me build an intuition. There's this nice paper called uh, The Jewel of Substitution is Redecoration. So if we think about uh, monads and free monads in particular as being about uh, expressions with variables. So if you think about your monad as like a tree, 
um, and you have uh, the free monad has an F in there and it tells you how the tree branches. And then at the leaves, you have the, the values of type A, which are like the variables. You think about this as like an AST. You have a tree, that's your AST, and then variables of the leaves. Well, the monad, if you interpret the free monad in that case, it basically corresponds to substituting um, those variables for new sub-expressions. So we take an MA, so an AST with variables of type A, and a function from A to MB, so that's a function from variables to ASTs with variables of type B, then it sort of graphs in those, um, those, those replacement values for the variables and gives you back something where all that's left of the, the leaves is the new B variables. Okay. Well, this paper says that uh, the jewel of substitution, which is that process, is redecoration. So we can think of co-free coal monads, and, and, and that gives us an intuition for coal monads uh, generally, has been about this idea called redecoration. So where our AST has variables of type A, now the coal monad uh, at A, uh, we can think of as having annotations, an AST with annotations of type A. Um, and to redecorate those annotations corresponds to, whoops, to redecorate those annotations corresponds to uh, the culminatic duplicate operation. So, or the extend operation. So we, we look at uh, the annotations for every sub-expression and the sub-annotations for all the, you know, sub-sub-expressions for each of those. Um, and the extend operation allows you to take all of that information at every given location in this AST combine all of those annotations and subtrees into one new annotation and redecorate the tree with those new annotations. So this is kind of useful for things like ASTs where you want to compute. Um, let's say you have an AST with annotations that have you know, position information or something and then you want to redecorate it with error information or you want to redecorate it with more type information or something. It's, it's kind of useful for those sorts of things. So that's one, one thing that I find really useful. Um, another one is this uh, blog post called Call Free Meets Free. This was one of the things that really sort of made things snap into place for me. It's uh, by Dan Caponi. Um, and it's about the relationship between co monads and monads, or certain co monads and monads, uh, and co free and, and free in particular. So that's really worth reading. And you'll sort of see uh, where the UI stuff sort of clicked in my mind uh, when you read that, probably. Um, and then there's this wonderful post uh, by Gershom called Co Monads in Everyday Life which is about using commonads uh, to model uh, a, uh, like breadcrumbs or a menu in a website. Um, so obviously like the UI connection there is, is slightly more obvious, but um, this is another place where, yeah, that really helped me build an intuition. All right, so my intuition though um, is all about declarative UIs. Um, so let's talk a bit about declarative UIs. Um, what time is it? Okay, uh, so here are some trends in UI development recently. We don't want to do direct manipulation of the DOM. We are interested in one-way data flow, so our model determines our UI. Um, we, we, we don't want to do two-way binding, like you know, in, in some, of, some previous libraries, like Knockout was one that I used for a while. Uh, but these days we sort of prefer one-way data binding from the model to uh, the rendered DOM, um, or the virtual DOM. And we want to describe what the UI state should be, not how to reach that state. So we don't want to do any direct, direct manipulation of the DOM. We just want to um, say, this is what the DOM should be. Please make it so. Okay. Um, so there's this thing called virtual DOM, which uh, has made all of this quite simple. And um, like a lot of libraries use this approach now. Uh, the API can be simplified and summarized like this. So you have a data type of <clears throat> virtual DOM representations. And I have a type argument E here representing events. Uh, which means like, you know, data that can be uh, bubbled up from things like mouse clicks and keyboard presses. Um, so uh, you'll see why that comes up in a second. Uh, so we have this one uh, data type called BDOM for those things, one called patch, which represents the difference between two uh, virtual DOM representations. So we have a function called diff, which takes a pair and gives a patch. Um, and then a function called apply, which takes a patch and patches that onto the actual DOM. Okay. Um, like I said, please tell me if you have any questions on any of this stuff. Um, so give, given that API, we can build a component library. Um, and a component for a model consists of an initial state, which is a value of that type of models, and a rendering function for our models to uh, virtual DOM elements. And the event type that gets raised is the new model that you want to replace the current model with when the user initiates an event. Okay. Well, uh, okay, so here's an example. Um, we have a counter. It's 
internal state is an integer, the initial value is zero, and to render uh, a given value is to just draw a button. Uh, it will tell you the current value by showing that value, and then on click, um, the, the value that gets returned uh, ignores the event, but it just increments the current value by one. So when we run this um, in React or whatever, um, it's just going to sit there and every time you click the button, it will say zero, one, two, etc. Okay, well, if you look at the type of that component, uh, the type signature, it looks almost exactly like store. Um, so let me go back a second. So we have initial state, which is a model, and a render function, which is a, mod a function from that model to virtual DOM elements. And if you remember what store was, it was S and S to A. So this is a store of model and V DOM model is my A. Okay. Um, so here, here's that as a type signature. So a component now is just a store where the state type is the model, and at every state type, I can produce a VDOM with the same model type. So we can ask, is core monad interesting here? What do the core monad uh, methods do? So extract takes a, a component and gives me a VDOM, and duplicate takes a component and gives me a whole store full of components. So this one is probably a little more obvious. This one says, uh, given the component in its current state, just render what the current virtual DOM is. So if you, if you at any given point needed to render this thing, you could just extract the current VDOM and uh, patch that onto the DOM. But it's less clear what duplicate is doing. So this, this is taking a component of models um, and giving me a store full of new components. Okay. Um, well, we said the, the extract function renders the, the current state. Uh, duplicate, uh, here's how I explain it. I say that it captures the possible future states of the components. Okay, so um, if we have a single component, then we can duplicate that. Um, and remember that uh, duplicate takes a W to a W of W, so we have a store of stores, and component was just a store. So we can wrap this up as a store of components. So if we think about this store as representing not just one value, not just one component, but um, all future components, all, all possible components that we could uh, reach from the state, Right, then, then that sort of makes us uh, uh, clearer when we say we, it captures the possible future states of the component. So duplicate takes a component and it gives us the future states of that component. Okay, so uh, we can. You know, I have a question with that duplicate um, method. Mm -hmm. I've always been kind of curious about it. Um, the uh, I'm trying to figure out where this uh, uh, intuition of the duplicate being the po all the possible future states. Right? Mm -hmm. Is, does this come from the interplay between the Extract and duplicate, and like the other methods of the Comonet, or is this like in the um, in the creator's mind somewhere of the Comonet idea, or or the like the, in the category thing? Um, no, so I mean, I think there's some there's connections with like future in like a temporal logic sense with with Comonets, right? But like that's not really, I guess you know, if you're asking like how I came to think of it this way, maybe that sort of played a role. But mostly, I just ended up sort of staring at the type of duplicate and seeing if it made any sense and how I might use it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, but if you think about like a, a common as being like a neighborhood or like tracking neighborhoods or multiple um, possibilities or this kind of thing, then, um, you know, if you think about this as like a future, or even if you just think about it as like, it takes a component to multiple possibilities, right? And, and if you have multiple possibilities, the natural thing to do is to pick one of them. And then by the time you're doing that yourself, you know, You've got a UI, right? You've got a way to step through a UI. So I think because that's the, all right. The, the signature of the duplicate is WA to WWA, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm always curious, like, because you're kind of making that internal WA and making that out of nothing. And I'm just wondering uh, what the rules are for the construction of that internal WA. Um, it, like, surely it must be the like some laws uh, uh, in that type of, in that type of class itself, kind of like the laws of the Monad class being. I mean, so, so there are laws that tell us that um, it has to be associative, right? Um, so like I had before with the co-classly composition, right? That mm -hmm. the duplicate has to, on its own has to obey uh, oh, associativity. Yeah, it must be associativity, yeah. Right. So if you can think about that in terms of future states, then that's like saying if you have two paths, then anything that's reachably reachable is reachable. Like, you know, you have like confluence of paths or something, right? Mm -hmm. Right, so um, you, you can think of it that way, I suppose. Okay. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I basically just end up sort of staring at the types and, uh, <clears throat> uh, and, and sort of 
building this intuition for it. And then, you know, I, I sort of tried out some different core monads and it turned out that they correspond to uh, interesting UI patterns, right? Um, but, all right, so the, the, the problem is, you know, I have this future, uh, future core monad full of future states, future components, right? Um, but we need to sort of, uh, we need to find a way to sort of explore that future and, and pick the next possible, the, ne the next actual future from this core monad full of possible futures. Right, so the user clicks a button and I duplicate my current core monad and I get a store full of components. And now I need to turn that store into a new component. Okay, so I, in order to pick a, a next component to render from this future store, I need a function explorer that takes a store of M of components of M and picks out a single actual future which is my new component to that, okay? So this is, this is the function we need to define. Um, and so just as a quick example, so if, like take, uh, if we want to explore uh, the store core monad in particular and, and get out a component from store of components, well, if you look at the types, a store was an M and a function from M to component to that. And you can ask, how could you implement this function? How could you implement this type signature generically for some M? Well, one thing you could do is to, uh, you could extract from the store, right? You could, um, you could take the M, apply it to the function and get a component and just return that. So that'd be like sort of reading the current state, right? Or you could move to a new state. So maybe I have a new M in mind, like that I want to move to, like a new model when the user clicks. So I could apply the function to my new M, get a new component and return that one. So um, I either read, I either look at the current M, um, or I apply a function to a new M, um, and I get a new component either way. Um, well, this this sort of uh, these operations can be packaged up using the state monad, right? Just reading and writing a state. Okay, so I could write a function called explorer that takes a state of M and returns a unit, and gives back uh, and a store like a possible set of possible futures um, in a store of M that returns a component and picks out a component of M. Right. And to uh, so if I'm a state state action and a store, then I just run the state on the current state tracked by the store. Um, oh, where's state come from? Oh, sorry, this is the state action. So I run the state action on the current state, get the new state, and apply the, the store function go uh, to the new state. Um, so that gives me a way to get a component. Of course, actually, the generic type signature of this doesn't have a component M in it. It's actually a state M unit to store M A to A. Okay. Um, so this is one way I could explore a possible uh, future of a, a, a store of possible futures um, is to provide a state action with the same state type. Um, and then we can go back to our component type and we can adjust it. So we can, instead of returning a model here, um, we can return a state of model of unit, which was our, uh, which was our exploration uh, tool, right? So uh, if you uh, use the type synonym we had before, this will look like a store of model of, uh, where the, the, the value type is a VDOM of state of model of unit, okay? Um, and if you uh, update the counter component, uh, then on click is the only thing that has to change. And instead of returning n plus one directly, we just call modify here. Um, so it, it might not be clear what we've gained here because I could have just used n directly because it's the same thing as value, right? But uh, the generality will become obvious in a second. Um, so to summarize, a component is going to be a store of models of v down of state of model of unit, okay? And um, we can render a component using extract, and we can observe the possible future states using duplicate. Okay. Um, well, let's generalize that a little bit. So um, we had a, a core monad here, and we had a monad here. Well, let's just replace those by W and M. Right? So we'll, we'll generalize to a component is a core monad full of virtual DOM elements whose events are uh, monadic actions. Okay, and this is all going to be the same. We're going to extract and duplicate to render and uh, observe the future. Uh, and it's kind of really important that this core monad is lazily evaluated, right? Because this represents now the entire future of our um, the entire future of our component. So when we had a store, remember a store is sort of automatically lazy because it comes with a function type 
uh, built into it. So, so functions that you know only evaluate their arguments as they're called. So that's not a problem. But in general, this needs to be lazily evaluated. Otherwise, we're going to try and evaluate the entire future um, of the components all at once. Um, I've, I've okay. got a question about that. You say that, uh, that this represents like all the like you can get all the futures of the component out, right? Um, this, mm -hmm. this, this says nothing about being able to go back in time to a previous state of that component, does it? Um, so like, some, no, so like if you want to pull like some undo operation, right? Then, then like uh, whatever your state is has to have that undo thing built into, this, into, this, into the model of that component, right? Right, so if you want to undo, what that means is, um, sorry, that's the dog's barking. Um, if, you want to, um, if you want to undo, it means that your component has to sort of um, have the sort of undo ability baked into it, which means that a given state has to, um, is, that, is that audible by the way? <laughs> sorry, the dog's That's barking. audible, but <laughs> what's sorry. Um, So uh, it has to have the undo built in, which means that the, the states have to appear as sub, like reachable from them. From themselves, right? It means that your state graph sort of has to have cycles in it. But that, there's nothing sort of preventing that. Um, okay. Yeah. It's just, like, you, just like you know, when you have the Elm architecture or React or something, you can support undo, and you can do it generically, right? So what's interesting is that um, you can actually support undo redo generically by using like a common transformer, like a zipper, for example, um, and just uh, add it generically to any uh, any common QI. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it gives me fuel. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Um, okay, so the, the the thing here is we have this W and an N, right? And they're completely unconstrained right now. We need some way to make sure they're related. So when we had store and state, you know, those we, we have store and state sort of feel like the same thing, right? We've sort of just shunted around the type variables a little bit. And traced and uh, writer sort of seem like they're the same thing. They're sort of doing the same job, but, um, you know, one's monadic and one's commonadic. Um, but how do we sort of cement that intuition a little better? So there's this idea of a pairing uh, between functors that becomes useful, right? Uh, but we need this, we need the existence of this explore function that we talked about before, where we have an M of unit and a commonad full of futures, and that action reaches into this commonad full of futures and pulls out the next actual future. Okay. Um, turns out this is very, very close to this general concept called a pairing where instead of a unit here, you have a function in here. So you say, uh, given a monadic action that returns a function and a space full of possible function arguments, well, the, the monad sort of drills down into the possible uh, arguments, finds the one argument that it actually wants to apply it to, um, and returns the function. The function gets applied to the value and return the, the next state. Okay. Um, so, so this is something that uh, Edward Komet had written a couple of blog posts about and I'd seen before. So I figured we should, you know, I should try this. Um, and it corresponds really nicely because uh, all of these commonads and monads pair up. Right? There's pairings between these things. And if you study the, uh, the different commonads and, and look at the types and implementations of extract and duplicate and say, well, what does this really mean if we think about this as possible future states and duplicate being like the creation of future states? Then it turns out these things actually correspond to like actual UI patterns that we're familiar with, right? So state and store pair together. And that turns out to correspond to something a little bit like React. So obviously a very simplified React, but the point is that um, you have a whole state monad, right? You can, you can, you're free to sort of inspect anything you want about the state. You can read it, you can write it. You're completely unrestricted. So in React, you have get state and set state, or this dot state and, and set state. Um, so, so this happens to correspond to React. It's very unconstrained. It's a UI pattern where the user, the, the, when I say user, I mean the implementer of the UI, uh, gets to basically have full control over the internal state of the component. Writer and traced is far more restricted. So you pick a monoid, and the only thing that the uh, implementer can do is to provide a monoid, and the, so always going deeper, right? The, uh, deeper into the into the, the traced um, the traced common ad. there's no sort of uh, there's no arbitrary hopping around the state you can't say go now go to this state right? there's no sort of go to the state there's just please append this value to the current uh, monoid um, and move to that new state so the only so of course you can get back to state so you could use like endo or something um, but if you don't have control over the monoid 
then it gives you far less control as, a, um, as an implementer of components over how you can build your components. So already even with these two, it's so, you know, so clear that um, there's, uh, there's, there's a trade-off between having control over your components and prescribing an architecture um, and sort of restricting um, you know, uh, the way in which you can write components. And hopefully you know, those are things that we can exploit for sort of optimization purposes or something. Uh, and that's something I'm still not 100% clear on. So I'm still working on that. Um, reader and env, this is another common ad. These pair up. Uh, I mean, it builds UI, but it's, it's not particularly interesting at all. Uh, it's basically, uh, you have one state, you can't move around, but that state can depend on a little bit of context. Uh, this is a very this is a very boring case. Free is much more interesting. So if you have free, then it, it pairs with a, a co-free monad whenever f pairs with g, okay? Um, well, it turns out if you simplify halogen and sort of extract the essence of halogen a little bit, um, then it, it turns out this looks a little bit like halogen, right? You, you pick a co-free monad that describes the state transitions, just like in halogen, you pick a free monad or uh, the signature of a free monad that describes the transitions that you want to allow. Um, and then the free monad pairs with the co-free co-monad um, and, and everything sort of works out nicely and you, you get a UI from this. But this, this works for any choice of F and G. Okay, so we can be very, very fine-grained with free monads and co-free co-monads in restricting the way in which our UIs can be created. Um, and if you instantiate G to a function from a given type I, so we have co-free of uh, arrow I, so where this, this is a, this is a, a type, arg a type um, construction of two arguments. If I apply it to one, I get a functor. So I can form the co-free co-monad over that functor. Well, uh, the, the thing that pairs with arrow i is tuple with i. Um, so this becomes my state of act. This becomes my action space, right? So I have a free monad, but the only thing I can do, uh, the only action I can perform in my free monad is to uh, give you an i. So, so I can I can emit an I. So in, in the core routines library, this is called producer. Okay. Um, so my actions evolve going to this producer that I, that I give you, um, and I explore this space, this core free commonad, um, where the various layers uh, differ by um, they, they wait to receive this uh, this input type I, and it corres this corresponds to uh, Redux RL, right? So if you if you sort of look at the types and, and figure out the types a little bit here. This turns out to be the action type in L, this I. Okay. Uh, and there's a sort of hidden state type that's baked into this, uh, baked into this uh, call free call monad. So you have a state and actions that act on that state. It turns out to correspond to these things, Redux and L. Okay, um, so this is sort of a little bit too much work because we have to define a call monad and a monad. And I don't want to have to do both. I basically want to have to pick a call monad and then think about, you know, I, I just want to observe what UIs they correspond to. Sounds more interesting than having to find a monad uh, as well. So uh, it turns out Edward Komet already figured this out, blog post in 2011, um, that you get a law abiding monad every time uh, you have a law abiding co monad called co W. Okay, so if W is a co monad, then co of W is a monad. What's really cool is that the co monad pairs with the monad automatically. So if you look at the type of co, it's sort of like the type of a pairing uh, partially applied, right? So it's sort of exactly what it has to be. If you were to, if you said, please give me a functor that pairs with um, this given functor w, um, you, you might sort of write this down naively, and then it turns out that it pairs, right? Which is a nice convenience. But what's really cool is that it's also a monad whenever w uh, is a co monad. Okay, so this is great because now I don't have to, I can ignore this column. I can pick the core monad, use co w as my action type, um, and I only have sort of one dimension to worry about, which is great. Um, so to summarize again, a component is described by a co monad full of possible future VDOMs, where the VDOMs raise events or actions of type co of w, which is my monad now of the unit. Okay. So by varying this W, we get lots of different UI architectures and we can restrict the way in which our developers can write UIs. Um, we can select the new next feature states uh, using an action of type co of W. Okay, so we can make a little, uh, a little type alias for that just for convenience. 
So a handler, when we're in this context, W, uh, is just an action of type code W unit, and a component uh, for the context W being a comma is a, uh, a, a comma node full of possible future VDOMs where, we, uh, where our event types raise handlers uh, of W. Okay, and this is exactly what PureScript React Explorer implements. Uh, so that was that library that I put at the bottom of the list of the on the first slide. Um, and that's, that's the library in a nutshell. Um, and it has sort of other interesting uh, common ads and, and common ad transformers and things in there too. Um, but that's the gist. So the idea is that we've, uh, you know, why is this interesting? So we've unified appro various approaches to UIs that sort of seemed a little bit similar, but it wasn't obvious how they were similar. Um, but now we have a common abstraction that like extracts the essence of them and, and makes them the same. We have control over uh, state transitions. Okay, so by picking the core monad, we can arbitrarily control uh, the type of state transitions the user can express. Um, and these core monads become uh, sort of uh, representations of the architectures themselves, right? the UI architectures themselves. Uh, so one of the questions on, on one of the early slides was how can we talk about UI specifications and how can we make the specifications themselves first class? Well. Now we have a whole category of specification languages, which is this, the, the common ad category and common ad morphisms. Right? Um, so that's how we make them first class. And common ad morphisms correspond to interpreters. So for example, uh, it's true that every common ad can be, uh, has a natural transformation to a certain store common ad, which tells us that every common ad QI can be implemented in, inside React because React corresponds to a store. Uh, similarly, because of the endo trick that I said, every writer can be, sorry, every trace common can be turned into a store as well in a different way. Um, and every store can be turned into a writer and various things are equivalent, right? So we have these, uh, we have this category of architectures and morphisms between them. Um, and what's also kind of cool is that uh, there's not very little, there's, there's very little I assumed about the, the category in which I'm working here, right? I, I want, um, to be able to form common ads, and presumably, you know, the category has to have certain nice properties so that I can treat it like lambda calculus or whatever. But um, I can I can generalize this to um, lots of different categories. So I could work in, for example, the incremental category, which is the one I uh, that I'm interested in when I talk about this library uh, purview, right? The one that uses incremental lambda calculus. Um, so that tells me that just like I have a just like I have a simple model of incremental UIs, I have a whole Actually, I have a whole category full of incremental UIs because I can take any common in the incremental category um, and, and use that to build the UI as well. Um, and, and the last thing that's really cool is we can actually use this intuition that common ads, the, the common ad category is sort of equivalent to this UI specification category to go and find new common ads because we can say, well, I have this idea that, I, that I'm familiar with from UI design. What common ad represents it? Right? Um, so we can pull back knowledge from UIs try to learn about common ads. Um, okay, so a little bit further reading. I wrote up this paper, it's two pages long, it goes over what I've just talked about. It's called The Clouds of the Eyes of the Future and the Future is Common Attic. Um, this is, this is the, the, the short, it's, it's short and, and dense, but uh, you might like to have a glance at this. Um, Arthur Xavier uh, worked for his bachelor's thesis on this, this two-part uh, uh, summary paper with, uh, about core manners for user interfaces, but uh, he found some really interesting stuff uh, that extends it as well, which is awesome. So he found out how to extend it to asynchronous components um, and also how you can extend it to uh, communicating components. Um, so so the, the, this goes into far more detail and, and explores some other sort of interesting aspects of the problem. So check those out if you're interested. Uh, all right, so that's the end of the, uh, the basic talk, but I have a few more slides of sort of crazier stuff, uh, but it's probably a good time to uh, take a little break and ask if anybody has questions. Yeah, I was just going to ask, oh, but what about nesting components? That's, the, that's like the essence mm -hmm. of a lot of uh, UI frameworks. So I suppose that's right. what we'll talk about next, yes? All right. So the first thing I did with, oh, the first thing I did with nesting components was to try uh, common ad transformers, um, which was actually the approach that Arthur took in the first part of his thesis as well. And that works, uh, that works pretty well. Um, but the problem with common ad transformers is it doesn't really correspond to the way in which we think about combining components in the real world, right? Because we think about 
you know, here's a component, here's a component, smash them together, get a new component, share some state if necessary. Okay. Um, it's not like here's a component and here's another component. Well, I'm going to embed this one inside this other one. And, um, you know, there's no like, often we don't have like an owner, right? There's not like, there's like, this, it's supposed to be symmetric, right? Um, so so that, that was a problem with the transformer approach, even though it gets you a long way. Uh, so um, this, this sort of leads into the next, next section, which is about combining components with day convolution. But um, does anybody have any other questions before I get into that? Um, yeah, I had one. You were, um, I've looked at the Comonad library in PureScript before, and I see the explore function. Um, and right. I, I had built up, uh, well, I had some Comonad, some Comonad and I'm like, I, I, okay, what do I do with it? I'm like, okay, I see the explore function, and that must be what I use to like collapse a Comonad into some value, so something. But then, but then <laughs> I ended up later deciding that the fold, uh, like the, the foldable aspect of Comonad is what I was actually looking for. Um, I think mm -hmm. I had a free come on at the at the time. Yeah, so so, so explore is like you know, this whole can explore and fold, or like as right. general catamorphism. Um, sure. So so um, explore is like I have this whole future, like whole space of possibilities, and I want to pick out one of them, right? Like I want to reduce the space to one possibility. Whereas fold is I have this big space of possibilities, and I want to combine all of that information into one value. But I'm going to take into it, I'm going to take into uh, consideration all of it, possibly. Like, so explore is, if I, if I think about this as a tree, of like, you know, the evolution of my possibilities or whatever, with possibilities reachable from other possibilities, then explore always takes like a linear path down to a leaf, right? Whereas fold works bottom up or top up, but it, top down, but it, it takes the whole tree possibly into consideration. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, any other questions? No? All right, I'm going to go into this. One. Let me okay. Oh, yeah, Vlad was wondering about if there's an adjunction -y relationship uh, between W and M. Um, I wonder if that was in the explore function. Um, right, so uh, every, if you have, um, yes, the answer is yes. If you have an adjunction between uh, M and W, then you have a pairing. So you can use this. The problem is uh, adjunctions are a little bit too restrictive uh, in the setting, especially in uh, in the um, in pure script and in Haskell, where uh, it, it basically means that the only common common and monad um, that you can uh, that you, yeah the only common and monad um, that you can talk about is basically uh, writer and traced which isn't terribly interesting. Oh, the state and store, I think, as well, maybe. But uh, it, it reduces the space a little bit too much. But, um, but basically, yeah, there's, there's something adjunction going on in that. And I, I sort of struggled with that for a while because I, I wanted there to be something a little more... Uh, like I wanted the relationship between the core monad and the monad to be something more standard from category theory, and I hoped the junction would be what it was. But if you, if you try it, it just seems too restrictive. Um, and... Uh, uh, Pairing is sort of like this, it's not this great concept because this like pairings are sort of too, um, there's too many pairings for a given functor, right? If you actually construct a whole category of pairings and it turns out that that thing co that I constructed, like the, the Edwards blog post constructed, uh, it turns out that's like terminal in this category. So there's some structure, but it's it's just, it doesn't seem, it's not it's not great that you, you can't use junctions. Uh, I, I would like that to be a little more, uh, interesting, but I haven't figured out what's going on there yet. So the, that that pairing thing um, it, mm -hmm. it, is that a, a junction? Um, every, every, like junction a gives, every junction between F and G means that F and G pair, but mm -hmm. uh, not every pairing comes from an junction. Okay. Yeah. And adjunctions are unique up to isomorphism. Given given a, an adjunct, given right, given f and g a joint, uh, g is unique. Given f up to isomorphism and vice versa, but that's not true for um, pairings. Mm. Okay. Uh, yeah. That yeah, that's all the questions uh, in the chat. I hope that's right? correct. I feel like that's correct. Sorry, remembering like grad, uh, category theory class. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. Anyway, pressing on. So I'm going to get through the rest of this pretty quickly, but this this sort of this rabbit hole goes pretty deep. Uh, 
And this is the stuff that I think is really interesting, but it's also the stuff that's the most hand wavy. So I'm gonna, um, also I have a pool party, so I'm gonna get going pretty soon. Um, so uh, Brian Day in 1970 defined this uh, monoidal product on uh, functors in monoidal categories called the Day Convolution. And in Haskell, you can write it like this. So it's an existential type uh, X here is existential, and a day product between F and G is a new functor. That's why we have this A here. And it consists of a pair of an F and a G. And a G it contains inside of this existentially, it's a G of X, where X is this existential type variable. And F has uh, a function from X to A inside as well. Okay. Um, so this is all about abstract. You can sort of apply it to a few things to see what's going on. If you take... Um, the, the traced cormonad, for example, and, and take two of these things and, and they convolve them together. Then you can do a bit of uh, shuffling around of type variables and look at some isomorphisms, and it turns out you have um, a traced cormonad for the product of those two things. Okay. Um, so uh, in general, there's there's a few sort of uh, there's a few nice isomorphisms here. So if you take two stores, uh, the day convolution corresponds to um, the uh, the, the store of the product of the two store types. Um, if you, in general, if you date convolve a store with any other cormonad, you get the store transformer applied to that cormonad, same with traced. Um, anyway, so uh, I was aware of this thing, and you know, if you remember here, I said uh, we can use this intuition to pull back knowledge from UIs to, to in intuition about cormonads. And I had the same question you had, Alex, which is, well, I can combine components, and you know. Combining components doesn't really take into account like the internal architecture of a component. Right? So what I really want to do is have some like there really ought to be a way to take two commonads and give me a new commonad that's symmetric in those two things and that ignores its internal structure. Uh, and I sat there and I thought about it for a little bit and I thought this same kind of seems a little bit like you know uh, have these state spaces and I want to like sort of form some like sort of product between these state spaces and I still haven't quite got an intuition for what's going on. Uh, with this thing, but it reminded me of date convolution. I can't remember exactly how I came to that conclusion, but you know, something to do with spaces and stuff I'd read on NCAT lab or something, and, and, and I figured out this thing that day FG is a commonad whenever F and G are both commonads. Okay, so this is this is cool because, to the best of my knowledge, this was not known, um, and and the only reason I sort of came to this conclusion was that it sort of had to make sense given this intuition for UIs, right? Um, and in fact, more is true. So uh, if you have two uh, cormonads, F and G, you can form their day product and you get a new cormonad, but it gives it far more structure. So it actually gives it the structure of a closed symmetric monoidal category. Okay. So uh, what does that mean? It means that it's symmetric. So day FG is isomorphic to day GF. Uh, it means that uh, it, there's a sort of like pentagonal identity that you have to satisfy to make a commutative, commutative diagram. And, um, the, uh, there's a unit for this thing, so the identity functor. Uh, if you think about UIs, right, identity functors are really boring UIs, one where you only have one state. Uh, well, that's the unit for day convolution. So that says that if I have a component which never changes um, and I combine it with a component that can change, well, the specification language overall doesn't change, right, because the other one doesn't add any new sort of interesting behavior. The interesting thing about this is this, this closed thing, though. Um, so, uh, so we have this symmetric product, right? And that's, that's, that basically means we have a sort of tupling operation. Okay, closed means that you can also um, there's also a function uh, type essentially, which um, which so such that we can carry and uncarry with respect to the, the tupling operation given that it's symmetric in another category. Okay, um, so intertwined with this idea of cormonads as UIs and um, you know, uh, and, and day convolution as uh, as com composition. There's also this weird idea of like functions. We have this basically whole uh, linear lambda calculus model that's built around day, where the objects of this category are cormonads. The tupling operation is day convolution, and the function space, the linear function space, is this uh, is this internal hom that we get from this this closure property. Okay, um, and it gives us this whole new way to think about. Um, this language of specifications and morphisms because we have um, this like linear lambda calculus at our disposal. The reason I bring up linear lambda calculus, by the way, is that there's a result that um, what we call like the internal logic 
of a symmetric monoidal category is linear lambda calculus. Okay, so this is like right at the fringe of the stuff that I know about uh, category theory. So please don't like ask me any detailed questions about this because I don't know what I'm talking about. But um, so if you, so, basically, what that means is linear lambda calculus can be interpreted in any symmetric monoidal category where we think of the objects as the types and the uh, the uh, morphisms in the category as the functions. Okay, and that, that language is uh, linear. Um, okay, so deconvolution, as I said before, there's these nice isomorphisms. Sorry, these slides are a little bit jumbled, but uh, if you deconvolve with a store, you get store T. Same with trace, you get trace T. Same with M, you get M T. Fortunately, it's not true for co um, uh It gets a little bit tricky to work out quite what's going on there. But I suspect if there's like, there may be a condition involving adjunctions or something, uh, perhaps that, that makes that result go through, that would be nice. Um, so what does day teach us about UIs? Well, uh, it teaches us this thing that I suspected, uh, that, that I already knew about UIs, but that uh, now we can phrase in this language of uh, commonads, which is that there's a way to compose declarative UIs um, in such a way that it's, it, it doesn't care what the individual UI architectures are. Remember that these objects of this, this category represent UI architectures, not UIs themselves, right? So we have a product of UI architectures, but it's natural, meaning that like, it, it doesn't care what the individual UI architectures are. Given any two UI architectures, I can produce a new one um, that, that combines, you know, two, the, the implementations of that thing consist of, you know, implementations of each of the two. Um, and it preserves all the information, right? So if, if I want to have two teams and, and one of them is really good at writing LMA architecture components and one of them is really good at writing halogen components, I can write a type signature that like specifies how my team works. I can say my application is a day convolution of, what would it be? Some co-free commonad and, uh, and a war machine, right? Um, and I've preserved all that information and, and, and everything is, uh, you know, I can lift morphisms to interpret on one side. You know, it doesn't care what the internal structure is. So I think that's kind of cool. Um, so I was talking briefly about symmetric monodous categories. Uh, we have this bifunctor, um, that's the tensor operation, which is going to be day in our case. That takes a pair of uh, objects, which are core monads in our case, and gives us a new core monad. We have a unit i, which is the identity functor in our case, which is associative and symmetric, up to isomorphism. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to wrap this up real quick. Um, the closed thing, like I said, tells us that we have this function, this internal HOM, which is right to join, right to join, uh, yeah, to the, uh, the tensor. So uh, basically, it says that day, uh, partially applied day as a functor from common ads to common ads has a right to join, and that's the uh, the linear function space. Okay, uh, linear lambda calculus is the internal language of this sort of category, so we can uh, we can take any linear lambda calculus expression and say, what does this tell us about UIs? So as a very quick example of that, um, uh, this is the internal harm. I'm gonna skip ahead because uh, I'm gonna have to wrap up very soon. Um, so co, as it turns out, is isomorphic to the internal harm from, uh, co of F, sorry, is isomorphic to the internal harm from F to the identity. And if I need a co of W of unit, then I need an F arrow one of unit in order to uh, change states. Well, that says that I need, you can think about, you know, remember this is linear, right? So this says that I need to remove an F. This is saying a linear function from F to one is because I can't just sort of discard F, right? So it means that I have some way to annihilate F somehow. So we can think about this as like the annihilator of F. So to change states, I have to annihilate my culminant in this linear set it. Well, that's sort of interesting for a start because it means if I have a combination of UI components, then in order to change states, uh, because it's linear, everything has to be used exactly once. So I have to annihilate everything, right? So in order to annihilate a product, I have to provide annihilators for each of the uh, components. So this is an example, right? It is a linear lambda calculus expression written in the sub pseudocode. Um, if I take an annihilator for F and an annihilator for G, um, and what was I doing here? Oh, this is a pair, so this is a tensor, right? And I want to annihilate the day convolution. So I want to move in the state space for the day convolution. Then I can take my F and G from my pair, uh, annihilate F, annihilate G, and everything's used linearly, and this is a perfectly good term. So this tells us that, um, you know, I can combine, this is co of F and, oops, co of F and co of G, and I can get co of F tensor G, okay? Um, so, 
Uh, I think there's something interesting about this linear lambda calculus thing. As I said, this is this is more sort of hand wavy experimentally stuff that I have yet to completely figure out. But um, you can take this idea further, this symmetric Minova category. So if you have a symmetric Minova category, you can form uh, lenses. Okay, so I can take uh, a, a co-monad optic between S and A. Well, it's type changing, right? So it's like the lens, like we have S, T, A, B. Uh, it's a, uh, so this actually should be in my regular function arrow, but it's actually because, you know, it's a common morphism, so it's a natural transformation. Um, so I use a squiggly arrow. So I have a natural transformation from uh, S to the tensor of A and an internal arm from B to T. This is like a general lens in any symmetric monoidal category, I think. Uh, I'm not sure if that's actually 100% accurate, uh, but I, I worked through it in the common case and it, and it worked out fine. Um, and, and this looks a lot like, if you replace this with tupling and you replace this with a regular arrow, this looks just like the definition of lens, like the, sort of the old definition of lens before the Van Laarhoven representation in Haskell, right? Um, so that's kind of cool. Uh, but we have these optics between culminants, so we can say, what does it mean for, for a culminant to live inside another culminant, right? So we can come up with optics like A exists inside of the tensor of A and C, and if you change it into a B, then you get a tensor of B and C. Right? So this is an optic for the left-hand side of the day convolution. Or because um, you know, store T is isomorphic to store convolved with the thing it's transforming, I can say that A exists inside um, store TSA, or I can say that store exists inside of store TSA. So I have this little language for like reaching inside a core one doing some work, and coming back out and, uh, and, and having that apply to the whole structure. Um, so this is interesting. Again, I'm not 100% sure quite how this plays into all of it. It's all uh, a bit experimental, but I think it's kind of interesting. Um, and finally, I have this little library called PureScript Smash, which, uh, you know, because we have uh, this operation of date convolution, which is like, in, in this linear category, it's sort of like our um, linear product type. Um, well, we have records in PureScript. Why can't we have linear record types? Okay, so, so smash takes an R, which is a row of culminants, and it gives you a new culminant back. And because the day operation is symmetric, um, it doesn't matter what order you convolve them in, so you can take a row and the, the day convolution is well defined. Okay, so this is really handy for building UIs because you can take you know, um, a row full of UI specification, uh, UI architectures, get a new UI architecture, which is symmetric in all of those things. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, all of, all of the sub-architectures sub are labeled by the labels in the row, okay? Um, and this, this is like the record type now, like a linear record type now, linear lambda calculus. So it, it fits into that idea nicely as well. Um, and then I wrote a couple of blog posts about some little extensions of this, so it turns out you know, again, like if I, I was thinking about things that I knew about UIs and, and I wanted to sort of pull them back to knowledge about culminants. So it turns out that um, if you have a culminant and you try to equalize certain paths in that culminant, so this is like, then that also is a culminant, right? If you, um, that, that's like saying, if I have this UI architecture and I, I just have this sort of refinement that I want to like make, I want to restrict my, my implementers and my UIs even more just by this, like, this quality. Right, so I want, so for example, you talked about under redo or something, right? So I might have some cycle in my in a co-free culminant, for example, that sort of uh, conceptually corresponds to um, uh, con conceptually corresponds to uh, uh, undoing something, right? So I could say, well, here's my path that does something and then undoes it, and I want to equalize that with the identity path. Okay, um, well that gives me a new common add, and there's a, uh, there's a blog post I wrote with a nice little result that says certain equalizers actually preserve common addictness. Um, so that's cool. So that tells us that we can always apply more constraints. Um, we can always sort of refine the types of our common ads and and, uh, and and we still have, we keep a sensible UI architecture. Um, and finally, just like there's a day com day product that acts like a product, there's also a sum like construction that uh, corresponds to if I have two UIs and I want to show one but not the other, but I want to keep the state of both of them around in the background, even regardless of whether they're visible or not, um, then there's a sum uh, construction in the React Explorer library 
uh, that provides that capability. So it's not quite as nice uh, as day convolution because if you think about it, there's not really a good way to come up with a unit for this thing. So it's not like closed symmetric or even symmetric or any of these things. Uh, but it's kind of interesting that it exists and you can use it to build things like UI specifications for lists of things. Um, I think that's all I've got. Uh, so uh, this stuff all here is a little bit hand wavy and I probably can't answer any questions very well, but I'll give it my best shot if anybody has any. Um, yeah, I just had like a high level question about the relationship between that uh, day convolution for combining comonads mm -hmm. and the uh, optics uh, thing on top of comonads. Mm -hmm. Uh, are, are those compete, like, two different ways of doing the same thing, or is it the optics one is for changing the existing comonad using because that's what optics kind of does, right? It takes something inside of a comonad and kind of does some stuff to it inside. Mm -hmm. Is that is it that am I understanding that right? right. The, the, the um, optics. Uh, so actually, Edward Komet gave a really good uh, talk about this, and I forget where it was, but it's on YouTube, and he's talking about um, optics for mono transformers. Um, and the way he introduces it is that if you have a symmetric monoidal category, you can uh, you can start talking about lenses. Um, I mean, that sort of makes sense because lenses and linearity sort of go hand in hand, and symmetric monoidal categories are all about linearity, right? Um, so I, I saw I saw that talk and I thought, well, we've got big convolution, and I recently learned that it's a symmetric monoidal category, so let's make some lenses. Um, but yeah, the idea with a lens, you, you know, I, in my pro functor optics talk on, on YouTube, I talk about how you can think about lenses as, so you have a lens from S to A, you think of that as being like, an, you know, there's an A inside an S or something, but really what we're saying is that S is isomorphic to a tuple of A with something else, right? Well, these Coleman optics are just built in the exact same way. But what I'm saying is that it, it, I've replaced products with deconvolution, right? So we're saying that, at this big culminant S is isomorphic as culminants to a day convolution of a smaller culminant A with some other culminant. Fancy your question? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, the, the, other, the, the other question I had was about the term linearity that you used. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, the idea of consuming something, like consuming the argument to some function? Yeah, so in, in, in a linear lambda calculus, so if you think about functions in regular lambda calculus, I have like, you know, lambda, lambda uh, I can write things like lambda a goes to 42, right, which doesn't use a at all. And I have functions like lambda a goes to tuple of a and a plus one or something, which uses a twice, right? So those are valid in lambda calculus, but in linear lambda calculus, it's not valid because you have to use everything exactly once. And they're useful for thinking about a lot of things, so like resources or, uh, you know, I can think about if I spend a resource, I can only spend it once and I have to spend all resources or something, um, or costs, right? So if I have a dollar and a dollar buys a Snickers or something, like, you know, I, I can't, you know, I, I, can, I can't buy two, right? Um, and, I, you know, I have to, like, partition up the, the input and, and use everything exactly once. Um, so... So that's, um, that's what linearity is. And then like linear lambda calculus is, uh, like, like say lambda calculus where everything has to be used once. And it turns out that just like uh, Cartesian closed categories and model lambda calculus, well, symmetric monoidal closed categories model um, linear lambda calculus. So it just gives you another way to think about those and all language for uh, talking about terms and, and makes it easier to sort of wire them around and, and these kinds of things. Mm, okay, that's, that's very helpful, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? I don't think so. Cool. All right, I'm going to put myself on mute and stop sharing my screen. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thanks a lot, Phil. That was pretty good. Thank you much. Uh, Crystal said, when's the next LAPS script meeting? I'm going to try and sort one out soon. I've uh, got a bit of stuff going on, but I'm going to try and sort something out with that. Yep. All right. Uh, if nobody has any questions, I'm actually going to have to get going. So yeah, thanks for your have time. Have a good weekend. Yeah, you too. Talk to you in a bit. Bye. Any comments on uh, <laughs> the chat? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I wonder if anybody else has any other topics that they want to talk about or introduce or. That kind of stuff.
yeah, I guess I guess we were kind of talking about uh, um, uh, the the GraphQL at the beginning, and uh, that's kind of like an AST, uh, kind of like a, a monad. So yeah, yeah. The, I think maybe Dan in the chat mentioned something like some of this talk that Phil was talking about could apply to um, you know some GraphQL thing that you parse up. Um, but I don't know. I suppose that's more like a monad than a comonad. Hmm. I don't know. I'll have to, I'll have to go back and listen to the recording later to see if I can pick up the thing that Phil mentioned that uh, might have applied to. Uh, pricing GraphQL stuff and interpreting it. Yeah. It, well, it, it sounded a little bit like uh, at the beginning he was sort of talking about like transforming things on on the leaves of a graph. Um, mm -hmm. And that's when, yeah, it was, it was sounding a little bit like what GraphQL does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, well, I I thought the the talk was really interesting and in try, trying to generalize a lot of these uh, like architecture patterns. Um, it was honestly like pretty mind blowing, and I mm -hmm. was having a little bit of trouble like digesting it all. But. I love this stuff where you can like figure out the commonalities between like a lot of other concrete ideas, and then kind of. You, you know, choose a particular like uh, I think he was choosing the um, I don't know, I was look at the uh, slide he had but he cho yeah. chose like some part some particular data type and then boom you have yeah. like this uh, particular architecture or this other particular architecture or framework right right yeah and then kind of like consuming other UIs and letting like other comonads fall out of that mm hmm I love that kind of stuff yeah. I, I really liked his table where he was able to categorize each of these major frameworks, you know, Elm and Halogen. That was a really good slide. That was a nice intuition. I guess the other, the other thing that came to me was um, if you've done any image processing or signal processing, you know, you're always, you have this window. Like if you're doing an FFT, right, you have a window and you have to be sliding that window. And so I was thinking as he was talking about the, being able to store all the futures well, that's, that's sort of like when you do an FFT, you have to go out and get, you know, your neighbors or the neighborhood. Like if you do simple filtering, for example, on a 2D image is, is like that, right? Where you're getting the, you know, seven nearest neighbors. Speaking about signal processing, did you ever, have you heard about the day convolution in relation to signal processing? No, no, this is the first time I... Because I, yeah, I, 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 I've heard of day convolution in the, in the past and I've looked it up and I, I think there is some history for the day convolution in signal processing that might have been like its original first practical use. Um, but it's yeah. um, the natural thing that happens if you take like a sine wave and a, um, like a square wave and you can day convolve these into the, uh, into some new thing. And it has aspects of both of those in the, cause right. it'll, it'll look like a bunch of sine waves on that square wave. So it'll be like kind of go, mm -hmm. Chick -a -chick -a -chick. And it goes up to the top and then kind of goes down to the bottom, like in the sine wave all the way through. Right. Um, so like, as far as, I suppose as another intuition for what the day conv convolution means, uh, you could look to that. So I think that's kind right. of worth mentioning to people here. I guess the other question I had about his lazy evaluation is I guess all the future states have to be known, right? Uh, and I guess in a, in, a, in a UI, yeah, you can probably guarantee that you that you have all the future states that you know them all, right? The well, I think it's is the fact quickly, that you can generate quick, those future states rather than knowing them all. Yeah, the that you can generate them. But, but the question is when you're comp computing them, how long does that take before you find the right solution, you know, mm -hmm. to, to apply the function to? Well, I think the explore, the, the explore function might be uh, just a concrete, simple algorithm. Yeah. No, I'm going to take a look at that library. I didn't didn't know mm -hmm. that it was out there. Good stuff. Yeah. 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 I'm I'm really interested in this comonad comonads for uh, UI stuff because like, um, like I've I've done like a kind of a, a fair amount of this you know front end stuff, where, and it seems like a lot of the complication uh, for making these 
uh, single page or apps or these JavaScript um, central apps. A lot, a lot of the complications come from the router. <laughs> like if you just want to render yeah. like one simple, one single HTML view, that's relatively simple. But like most often, you're going to want to change whatever you're looking at, right? So then, the, the, and then right. you get into like the router, right? So like I click this, and then I'll change my current route, um, like the route the route refers to the thing in the, the yeah. HTML location yeah. bar. Um, so I don't know. It kind of feels like the Comonad thing is the part that adds the routing onto um, whatever view you have, where like your current view is like a tree of components, and that kind of is like the um, uh, like a monad thing. Well, I don't know. Is that like a? Oh, uh, yeah, you might be right. Yeah, it's it's but, um, okay. So those are your future states, right? You have all these other components that you need to draw, right? Mm -hmm. or, or one of those components you need to draw based on something that the user has done. Right? Mm -hmm. But that also triggers a new route at the same time, right? Clicking on a button means okay, I, I've I've got a new route, and I need to go out and get some some information from the store. And present that information to the user, right? I think that's, you could probably think that the extracting from the database stores as well as drawing the component are, are the two th the same, right? They could be part of the state that you need to, uh, to draw and, mm -hmm. uh, and expose, I guess. Yeah, it's very interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty interested in developing a container for these JavaScript, uh, and, you know, web you know views a container for these such that you can you can pick any um you know framework or whatever and put it into this container and then you can and then then there is some um, machinery that takes whatever this whatever this container is and um can you know you know render it on the server render it in the clients and it'll like um as long as whatever you put in the container obey like uh delegates uh routing to the container in some way mm -hmm. if there's some yeah, then you can make another. I mean, you can, that, that solves a lot, of, a lot of problems. You can do code Have splitting. Have you played with um, um, Servant on a Haskell routing library called Servant? No, I haven't. I know it's a lot of typing yeah. and stuff. Again, one type, you know, to express all routes. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah. I've never implemented it, but I do. I was reading a, a, a blog post the other day on it. So. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, I suppose that's about uh, um, about, about it. I, 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 I kind of want to point out that um, let's see, we're gonna, we're gonna have another unscripted one month from now. Um, we used to have uh, uh, on the third Saturday of every because this is the second Saturday of every month we have this meetup online, mm -hmm. and then on the fourth Saturday of the month I think we have the hack meetup. Um, historically, we've been doing that. Um, I, I, I'm trying to step away from managing that hack meetup. Um, I posted on the PureScript uh, users discourse instance of, um, and, and it sounds like there's one or two people who are interested in taking over the hack meetup, um, but there hasn't been any uh, affirmative action on, um, okay, I'll, I'll do the planning for this next one. So I'm not sure, right now I'm not sure if there's going to be a hack meetup in two weeks. I'll have to do some more poking around on asking people about that one. So I otherwise, otherwise, I, like for, uh, there'll be four, four, uh, the, the next month, the August, the second Saturday of the month in August. Hopefully, we'll have another one. So I'd, I'd look forward to people looking forward, uh, people considering organizing what they're working on to present, present for that too. Um, I, I, I appreciate Phil a lot for stepping up to talk about his cool one ad stuff. Uh, you were also asking for feedback on the time. I think. This, oh this yeah, that's right. That you did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I like it. Certainly, it's nice to get to get you know i'm i'm on the west coast so it's mm -hmm. nice to get this done before noon right or, or yeah so. i think part of the reason but for having it at the um where it was is to give people mm -hmm. in like australia <laughs> and asia right um yeah. i know i think over I there it's like a no, six it's, or it's eight a.m time slot yeah yeah i talk to new zealand quite a bit so yeah yeah i i understand that yeah for them you know the first time I get to talk to New Zealand uh, is around one o'clock my time, West Coast time. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think yeah. that's part of the reason that we've had in the, in yeah. the time slot in that's the right. past. Um, yeah. I don't think we often have that people from that time zone, like the New Zealand, Australia people. Like, uh, I wonder if there are any that attended today. But I wonder if we keep going at a time slot like time slot like this, would this be bad 
to <laughs> just completely Jeez, discount uh, them completely, give, prevent them the opportunity completely from attending. Well, that's a good question. Do you get those analytics from Zoom? Do they tell you uh, exactly where people are? I don't think so. I'll, I'll, I'll I'm take just a look at the dashboard at again. The quality Zoom, uh, you know, we, for the Zoom is pretty good. It, it, it kind of sucks that you got to pay a lot to and uh, keep, you know, have a Zoom account. It's like is that fifteen bucks I think per month, but right. whatever. It's so much easier than anything else I've seen. It's certainly, yeah, again, like. I, even on Linux, it just kind of just kind of works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, video quality is good. Yeah. Mm, yeah, I'm just check, check, checking the um, chat. Yeah, he's just asking if they're if we if you're going to stick to the two hours earlier, or the usual um, time. Yeah, two hours early works better for Crystal. Um, yeah. Hmm. Not sure about that. I'm, I'm not sure about on discourse and ask for feedback from folks that are looking yeah. at discourse. Yeah. Yeah. Or Slack, I guess the Slack channel yeah. could also. Uh, yeah. I, I I seem to get more uh, response from the Twitters and the um, Slack more than the discourse. Yeah. Well, I don't. I don't it's know. Early why. days for discourse. I think that's why mm -hmm. people are just starting to move over. Yeah. Or add in my case, mm -hmm. I'm still looking at the Slack channel. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll do that. I'll, I'll post on. I'll, I'll post in a few different places and get some opinions. Um, hopefully, the New Zealand people can uh, answer that too. Then. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for attending, everybody. That's uh, and well, sticking around to chat afterwards. It's always nice to chat afterwards. <laughs> it is <laughs> to digest every time Phil gives a talk. It's mm -hmm. going to be hours of homework after. Yeah, it feels kind of like the uh, theoretical physicists and like the yeah. experimental and practical physicists. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. yeah. Take care. Yeah, take care, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah, thanks a lot, y'all. <laughs> Bye.